Alright, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'd. Leaders, what makes a good leader? And why do we need them as Muslims? Uh, it's no shock to you when you read a newspaper and you see what's happening in the world that the future that's, uh, hope, that we're hoping for insha'Allah is beginning to unfold. You know, we're, we're starting to see some really good progress within countries of Muslim populace where people are aware of Islam. And those who are not aware of the details of Islam want to become more aware of the details of Islam. And you can see this in Malaysia. I, I, I think I heard on Malaysian television, one of the top rated shows was the young Da'i, young Imam, Imam Yeah, what? Imam what? Was it one of the top rated shows? I don't know. Did you watch? Right? Yes? Did you guys watch any of its episodes? No, she didn't. She was rock climbing. Right? People, uh, even those who are not overly devout, feel that there is always something in their life that's missing. And there is a hole in each and every one of our hearts that can only be that can only be fulfilled and filled by the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a person who seeks to be an example for others is really fulfilling the instructions of Allah in the Qur'an. And uh, on Friday night I was reciting, I think Salat al-Fajr, the end of Surah Al-Furqan, where Allah tells us that Ibadul Rahman, those who are the worshipping servants of Ar-Rahman, the merciful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they make a dua and they say, وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama." Oh Allah, make us imams for those who have piety. There is absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to be a person that people look up to. And people say, wow, look at this guy, look at this girl. I want to be like them. I wish I could do what they've done. I want to be able to, to help others the way they've helped. And that's why we had assembled with you with you know these leaders from society that you live in, not people from overseas or from wherever, but people who are a part of your culture and part of your people who set that example for you, who are leaders. You want to be, when I'm talking about a leader as a Muslim, I want you to be the best doctor you can be, the best plumber you can be, the best car ri- uh, driver you can be, chauffeur if that's your job. Whatever it is that you're in, distinguishing yourself as an example for others to measure themselves by was always the way of the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that requires three essential elements. And this is really my talk with you today about preparing yourself for others to learn from your example. Without you saying a word, without you lecturing anyone, without you saying anything. First and foremost is internal piety. Don't fake it. Internal piety. I'm not talking about the external stuff. I'm not talking about what you look at from the outside or how you represent yourself. The internal piety is the most important aspect of your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, regularly you find at university anyway in Australia, you know, you come to the musalla, the place of prayer, the brothers are on one side, sisters are on one side. Uh, a sister, you know, coming, all the brothers, salam alaikum. They're looking on the ground, right? Prayers are finished, they go back into the university campus. All of a sudden, hey, how you doing, Sally? Oh, yeah, 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 did you finish that lab? Why don't we work on it together? All right, give me your number. And all of a sudden, this taqwa brother, who was like this, salam alaikum, sister. All of a sudden, in his regular day-to-day life, has no ideals that are firm. It shifts. If he's dealing with Muslims, he does it one way. If he's dealing with others, it's a totally different way. Right? That is not internal piety. Internal piety is a steady compass that leads you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In yourself, you're not faking it. You don't want to misrepresent. You want to be honest with Allah, sincere to Allah, 
that is because of your truthfulness with Allah. Now I'm not telling you, well, if you do it with them, you should do it with the Muslims as well. No, it's good that you know what's right and wrong. But you shouldn't embellish it. You shouldn't lose yourself and live a schizophrenic life. What's that schizophrenic life? Where you're double personality. You're two-faced. You're one way in front of your parents, in front of your family, in front of your Muslim friends, and you're totally another way when you're alone, when you're online, when you're you know, a totally different person, with different set of rules and ethics that you govern yourself by. That sets you up for downfall. And Allah promises the one who deceives other in that way, or the one who has that hypocritical capacity, will never find happiness in life. Uh, what's happening with Tom Cruise? No, I don't care about his religion. What's, he, what's happening now? Divorced? I can't believe. Shut your mouth. Really? Tom Cruise? Three hundred million dollar man can't keep a woman? It's his third wife. Holy cow. First wife, Mimi Rogers, dumps him. Second wife, dumps him. Refused to have children with him. Said, no, nah, you're not fit. I don't want anything to do with you. I got to get out. Third one is now petitioning the courts in America to give her sole custody. She doesn't want him to have anything to do with his child. On what grounds? He's not a fit parent. Tom Cruise, the guy that climbs up Burj Al Arab in Dubai? <laughs> He's like, he makes Spider-Man look bad. What's happening? Because what you see is not the real person. What she sees at home is not what you see on the screen. It's not the glitz and the grammar and the watch and the money and the Ferraris and the chauffeur. That's the same problem. That's what I'm talking about. It's schizophrenia. It's a schizophrenic life. Not clinical. But it's a double persona. It's a double personality. And no one, doesn't matter what your faith, that's why I'm giving you such a, you know extreme example. No one can sustain it. It's impossible. You cannot live a hypocritical life. It's called cognitive, cognitive dissonance. You can't do it. By your nature, you want your internal belief to be what and how you live your external life. That's how you are as a human being. And the moment you do that, there's dissonance. It's unbalanced. So you begin to crack. And a lot of the psychological problems that young people endure, a lot of the depression that a lot of young people endure, a lot of those things stem from that. They're asked to be one way, their parents expect one way, but when they're alone, and when they're with friends, and when they're with other people who don't have those expectations, they live a different way. And they know it's wrong. So they're unbalanced. And it results in self-harm. It results in divorce. It results in uh, uh, losing work. It results in dropping out of school. It results in drug abuse. It results in making you know sexual mistakes. It results in all of that. All of that comes because there is that imbalance. Internal piety does not match the external projected image. And a person who is a leader for our ummah, has to live that fine line of istiqamah, where what's inside and what's outside come to balance. They come to that middle ground. Second, so the first is that internal sincerity to Allah, that internal piety. Second, is relying on friends, friendship. Relationships. You can't be an effective leader without a team of people around you. Can you imagine this camp if it was just me? If I just said, okay, let's come together. Would it have worked? Don't you need people to cook, people to transport, people to clean, people to organize, people to film? You have to have a team. You can't do everything on your own. You can't just... Put it on yourself and pressure yourself. If I want it, I'll do it. If I, you know, I'll just, I just gotta work harder. 
doesn't work. You have to be able to rely upon others. But those others have to be the right people. You got to choose them. You can't just choose any person for any job. The Prophet ﷺ was a master of that. He chose the right person for the right job, for the right reason, at the right time. And people would sometimes say to the Prophet ﷺ, Are you sure you want to send him? And the Prophet said, Yes. I know what you don't know. You sure you want to send Usama to be the head of the army where Khalid ibn al-Walid is a, is a soldier in it? Really? Isn't Khalid ibn al-Walid the greatest military commander that we have? The Prophet says, yes, but I want to send Usama. Because I'm raising him to become a leader. He's going to become one of the lions of Islam. Right? Who do you rely on? Who do you befriend? Who do you share your secrets with? is a very critical decision that you must make in life. Who knows the most about you? See, you guys have seen my young kids, right? Shireen, uh, Umar and Adam. The greatest influence in their life is myself and their mom. Whenever Umar wants to show off, he's like, Baba, 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 Baba. Yes, yeah, Umar, show me. In a couple of years, that's going to change. I'm going to stop hearing that. It won't be Baba, Baba, Baba. It'll be who? His friends. Once they reach a certain age, once the formative periods are over, they don't really care what my opinion is. For many of you, you may not care what your parents' opinion are of how you dress, what music you listen to, what things you do, who your friends are. Well, I don't care. Right? You now want to impress. You would... You would rather impress your friends than your mom. You respect your mom. But you still care more about what your friends think of what you're wearing than what your mom thinks of what you're wearing. That's the reality of life. It comes to that point where you shift. Now if you've surrounded yourself by shallow, vain, untruthful, insincere, unethical, un-Islamic individuals, and they become your reference group. They become your mirror that you see yourself through. You're in trouble. You're in serious trouble. So your aim is that internal piety becomes external. How is it external? Because the people that you have surrounded yourself with are the mirrors of your life. And the Prophet ﷺ says, المؤمن مرآت المؤمن. A believer is the mirrored reflection of another believer. You see yourselves in them. You need to be able to see yourself in each other. The common traits of honesty and decency and love and affection and hijab and piety and honoring Allah and honoring your parents. That's what you need to see in your friends. The moment you look at your friend and you can't see what you want to see, you can't see what you expect to see, you need to make some quick changes in your life. Because sooner or later, that friend, their behavior is going to imprint upon you. That's going to be you. Third aspect of leadership that's extremely important for us is give it your best and leave it up to Allah. It's called tawakkul. Relying on Allah in everything you do. In your studies, in your exam in your work, in your family life. Never shortchange yourself. Never just do something halfway. The Prophet ﷺ says, anything worth doing should be done with ihsan, perfection. You must make the greatest attempt to do your best at it, or don't do it at all. Wait for another day, wait for another year, do it another time. But if you're going to do something, you got to do it right, or don't do it. What if I do something? How do I know it's going to be fruitful? Should I really give an attempt? And the answer is yes. How many times did the Prophet ﷺ, and in the history that's recorded to us in the Qur'an, how many people who thought there was no hope came out victorious, came out aided and given support by Allah from where they did not expect it? Thousands of instances in the Qur'an of people who did not think that Allah's help would come, arrives. And it could be as simple as that example I gave you about my forensics exam. 
C, 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 C. Give it a go. All right. I could have just answered the first five questions and then what? No. Fill up the paper. Fill it. Never, ever, ever shortchange yourself. Do everything to the complete and absolute best. And then leave it to Allah. You may be surprised that what you get is much better than what you had anticipated if you had the full time or if you had the full energy if you were, if you, or if you were capable of doing the complete project in the time that you wanted. So that we take from the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. The Prophet would be sitting in Mecca and the people of Mecca were killing his companions. They were torturing some of the poorest companions to death. The family of Ammar ibn Yasir. You know, Yasir and his wife Sumayya were killed, executed in front of the Prophet. And the Prophet can't do anything. All the Prophet could say is, إِنَّ مَوْعِدَكُمُ الْجَنَّةِ صَبْرًا آلَ يَاسِرٍ Be patient, O family of Yasir. I've made dua that I will join you in Jannah. That's all I can do. And the Prophet would see them. The Prophet Wasallam doesn't give up. Although Allah tells us in the Qur'an, حَتَّى إِذَا اسْتَيْأَسَ الرُّسُلُ Allah lets the prophets be tested to such severity that almost d- despair enters their heart. Musa standing in front of that water and Fir'aun coming from above the ridge about to collapse upon him and Bani Israel. Where am I going to go? It's an ocean. Despair is about to set. وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِبُوا And the prophets, it's almost as if they believe it was a lie. Maybe I'm not, div- I'm not given a message from the divine. They're at breaking point. جَاءَهُمْ نَصْرُنَا Our victory comes to them. Allahu Akbar. That's the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Orphaned as a child. Father, then mother, then grandfather, then uncle. Raised up in poverty in the desert. Wasn't given the ability to learn to read and write. Wasn't given that advantage in life. But yet was an honest person. He was so valued that even the richest of the women of the city wanted to marry him. He then became a widower. She died. His wife passes away. Leaves him as a, a single father with children. He had an, a second wife. He was only married to her. For, for 15 years, no other wives, just him and her out of love. And now he's got all these children. He's a widower, an orphan. His children die. He buries his own children. If you and I had just one, one of those calamities, just one, you lose your spouse, or you lose your parents, or you lose your son, may Allah protect our children. You, you crumble. The Prophet, look at all the hits he gets in life. Despair, you know, it's, it's a desperate life. He's chased out of his own city. Kicked out. He goes to another city. The people living in it plot against him. Put poison in his food. Want to drop stones on him as he's sitting under their buildings. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They don't leave him alone in his new city. They come after him in Badr. After him in Uhud. After him in Al-Ahzab. The only way to defend his city is to dig a trench. He doesn't have people to fight. He has to build a trench, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dig up the earth so they can't cross over. He has nothing except Allah. You think the Prophet sallallahu the best of creation, was put through all that because Allah didn't like him? Allah loves him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the love of Allah sometimes is disguised in hardship. Never ever ever receive hardship, never ever receive difficulty, never ever receive that difficulty of life and think, oh, it can only be punishment from Allah. What did I do wrong now? No. Sometimes that difficulty in life is love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how Allah showed His love for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu The Prophet didn't just bury his, gra- his children, he even buried grandchildren sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And yet, he is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in that is, for you and I, a lesson in life. Don't ever give up hope in Allah. 
Don't ever feel that you can't give it your best. Don't ever settle for second best. Don't ever just limit yourself and say, what more can I do? There's more that can be done. There's greater effort that can happen. And the first chapters that were revealed to the Prophet ﷺ are full of wondrous parables and imagery. The first ten chapters of the Qur'an all talk about darkness turning to light. All talk about wal-duha, the daybreak, wal-fajr, idha shamsu quwwirat. All of it talk about the imagery of a transition from the darkness of lack of faith into the brightness of iman and the consolidation of the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the message that is given to us in the Qur'an. And as dark as life may be, the sun will rise tomorrow. That's it. It's a promise. Even on the day of judgment, it may rise from the wrong side, but it's still going to rise. Does that make sense? Right? The sun will rise. And the sun of Islam is rising. And the ones who put it up there, and the ones who we seek to be a part of that movement that elevates Islam in the hearts of people, are you and I. Your job, my job, as I'm doing it with you now, is to transmit what we know, just the little that we know from the words of the Prophet, from the words of the Qur'an, to those who have not heard it, or to those who have heard it but forgot it, or to those who have heard it but not understood it. Even to your own parents. Don't think your parents, they know more than what you know. In fact, the reality is what you may have learned in these days, some of it your parents have never heard before. Right? Share with those the stories of faith and passion that lead us back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's really my word of advice that I want to leave you with today. And inshallah, if you have any questions that you want to send through to me, whether by email or Facebook or Twitter, uh, you can find access to them inshallah. And I really wish that our lives cross again in other ways. Because I may come back in, to Malaysia in 20 years time. I'll be a little bit older. Still cool though. <laughs> you know me, right? Lepek all the way, right? So we'll, you may be the guy sitting next to me. You may be the sister sitting next to us. Maybe it won't be me. Maybe it be my son Umar, right? Sitting in my place. That's life. That's what we want. That you are the ones who represent this faith that was given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'll hand you over to Brother Khairul inshaAllah to give us our instructions.